coming up on Shoppers Politics. And how do you feel when you saw the king meeting Ursula von der Leyen and shaking hands after this deal? Well, you know, I don't know whether it was his choice or whether the government persuaded him to do it. A decision was made, it was a bad decision, and I think it's a decision that the king will come to regret. Hello and welcome to Chopper's Politics. I'm Christopher Hope, the Associate Editor for Politics at the Daily Telegraph, and I'm here at the Red Lion pub on my usual bar stool a few days early this week to ask a very important question. Has Brexit finally been done? I'm pleased to report that we have now made a decisive breakthrough. Together, we have changed the original protocol and are today announcing the new Windsor Framework. Plenty of Tory MPs think that Rishi Sunak's Windsor Framework delivers finally a workable deal for Northern Ireland. On this bonus episode of Chopper's Politics Podcast, we'll try to answer that very question with contributions from the DUP's Brexit spokesman Sammy Wilson and Northern Ireland Office Minister and a former chairman of the European Research Group of Tory MPs, Steve Baker. But first, how different is the Windsor framework from the deal that went before? With me now is Raoul Ruperel, Theresa May's former Brexit advisor, to walk us through the details. Raoul, welcome to the pub. Great to have you on. Thank you. Thanks you for having me. You have been here for a bit, have you, with me? But good to see you here. It means that Brexit is happening again. What are the marks you'd give for Rishi Sunak's deal? Uh, so I think he's probably, in my mind, overachieved. You know, I'd give it eight, maybe nine out of ten in terms of where we thought this was going. I mean, just a few months, I would have said a deal was very unlikely. And, you know, he's achieved things that no prime minister before has achieved in the negotiations. Well, what are the things, then, you think, which Sunak's done, which others, Theresa May, Boris Johnson, haven't done? Well, I think the Stormont break is the biggest one. And I think the way it applies, not just to new laws being added to the protocol, but any changes to the existing body of regulation uh, is really important. Mm. And that allows uh, you know, Stormont to raise a concern in UK to have a veto. If there's a 30% vote in Stormont, then the UK can veto. Yeah. And I think you know this is a power that actually most member states don't have. You know, OK, some member states have a veto over certain parts of EU law, but not over goods regulation, not over SPS regulations and changes to them. SPS is? Uh, the laws governing agriculture and trade across borders orders for food. So yeah, so I think it is a really important shift and something which, you know, we have tried to secure before. If you remember the Theresa May time, we looked at Stormont Lock Mm -hmm. and we couldn't secure that in in the legal text or any changes and and he has managed to do that. Would it be used? I mean, Ursula von der Leyen said it was an emergency break, of course, and and it only can be brought in with significant change. These are words which may mean it can't be used at all. Well, look, I'm not sure how often it will be used as the best metric for uh, whether the veto is good or not. You know, I think it's mm. it's in the a threat core, of it could be enough. Exactly, it's in a core part of the protocol. It applies to the body of regulation and any changes and amends there. And let's not forget, you know, these rules on goods regulation, on food regulation, are things that do evolve over time and are quite regularly updated. So there are opportunities there to use it. But I think, yeah, whether it will be used or not is not the best metric. You could construct a veto that's off to the side of the protocol and and could be used very often, but it's not meaningful. This applies to very meaningful parts of the protocol. The ECJ, European Court of Justice, still has oversight in some parts of regulation in Northern Ireland. That's not Brexit. Well, I think the important part here is the scope of EU law has been brought down and the numbers of EU law... Like 3% front. or something. Exactly. And, it, you know, let's laws. not forget it only applied originally to, you know, certain goods and, and food regulation. And now that's been uh, reduced further. And so the scope of the ECJ in that sense has been narrowed quite significantly. And then on things like the break, you do have the oversight of arbitration rather than the ECJ. So where there is that kind of dispute mm-hmm. between the UK and EU on an international level, it goes to arbitration rather than to the ECJ, which I think is an important principle. Companies, though, are still treated differently in Northern Ireland compared to Scottish companies or Welsh companies? Well, I think if you speak to Northern Irish business, they seem pretty happy with what's been achieved. You know, they do like having the access, mm, to seamless markets. access to both markets. There are still, look, there, there are the red and green channels. And even in the green channel, there are some requirements. But I think we are significantly improved. Before where you had to have potentially hundreds of certificates for a, a truck full of food, you can now get that down to one certificate. On customs, yes, you still have to provide some data, but it's usually the data you have for a commercial transaction anyway. And you can provide more data up front to get mm. into the kind of trusted trader program and you don't have to provide it every time. So I think these are real step changes in, in the barriers. Look, it's, it's never going to be completely perfect, but I think most businesses you speak to in Northern Ireland are really encouraged by, by what they're seeing, and it gives them certainty and clarity. Were you surprised by what Mr Sunak pulled out of the bag yesterday? 
Yeah, I, I was, to be honest. Um, I think the, the break in particular was surprising and the breadth and, and what it applies to. I also think that, you know, the EU has been resistant to many of these things before. So, for example, significantly reducing certificates for food products, they've resisted that and they've now agreed to it. You know, accepting the grace periods, basically, that we have for parcels, pets, mm. for seeds and, and plants, you know, which are important to the everyday life in Northern Ireland, people moving across the border from GB to NI. Those have all been accepted and, and ingrained now in the protocol and and you know they resisted even giving a grace period for those things so a temporary thing and now they've accepted and their the border is now not in the Irish Sea is that right so there is the uh, well it depends what how you, you look think? at it so the border is is still there in a sense but obviously you have the green and red channels so if you're moving from GB to NI in the green channel um, there's no border it's it well there's very minimal minimal checks and it's not very different to moving within the rest of the United Kingdom so Look, it, it is always going to be in a slightly unique place because of you know history, the history and, and the nature of Northern Ireland. But it's very hard to argue this isn't a step change. And if you think to where we were with the EU when they put forward their proposals back in sort of 2021, uh, 2022, you know, this is, is to me light years away from that. And, and it does achieve quite a few of the mm. aims in the command paper that Boris Johnson published. So, so who's, who's moved then? It seems to me that the EU has moved. Is that right? I mean, Yeah, I think this in this case, we have seen some real movement from the EU. It's not always the case, you know, having been involved <laughs> well, in negotiations. <laughs> I've gone um, grey to my, to with you about Brexit. Exactly. Years. I mean, I think, but I think that to their credit, they did a lot of engagement in Northern Ireland and engage with businesses and, and unionists and I think there are signs they have listened to the real concerns and credit to the unionists in, in Northern Ireland who have continued to hammer on these very real concerns mm. about the practical applications so they have taken some of those on board look obviously the UK hasn't achieved everything it wanted you look at the state aid I think that's probably not as um, how's that working so what they've reinforced is that there won't be any reach back in the state aid into the rest of the UK so you know the EU state aid rules will apply in Northern Ireland but the, the concern was that they could reach back into a transaction that involved a, a GB company or or something in that sense. And they've tried to So that's good for GB companies and good for companies in Britain who need support, but not for Northern Ireland. Well, I don't think it's necessary. It's a very hypothetical concern that, you know, there might at some point become an issue around state aid. It's not something we've ever seen, so it's hard to say. Um, it's not something when I speak to NI businesses, they really are that concerned about. Um, but I think if you look at what the UK had set out to achieve and hoped to achieve in that space, that's probably one place where they've underperformed. But as I said, in other areas, they have overperformed. So, so, yeah, eight out of ten, as you said earlier. Yeah, I think I think that's that's the kind of realm we're looking at. Is it? Brexit done then, Raoul Rupra? Well, I think. <laughs> Why are you laughing? <laughs> Will Brexit ever be done? Is the question. Um, look, I think even with this, like a, as we said, there are going to be things. You have the Stormont break. The rules are going to evolve. Things are going to change over time. There's reviews within a trade agreement, etc. So, look, there will always be these ongoing discussions. But I think this has the opportunity to mark a change in the relationship and put us on a slightly new footing and a, and a discussion where you're more focused on the technicalities and the implementation than on the big politics and mm. that side of stuff. We've got Sammy Wilson, who's the DUP's Brexit spokesman on the podcast. What's your advice to DUP? Well, look, I think this achieves many of the things that they've asked for. I would say they. my concern is that they are now moving the goalposts slightly. You know, they say there can't be any EU law in Northern Ireland. Well, if you look at their seven tests, that wasn't one of them. And, you know, that is a very different thing to saying we need to have some democratic say. And if you also look at the fact that, yes, the Stormont break is, is activated by the UK, but ultimately they want to be part of the union and therefore in international matters, the UK is the one that has to act for them. I mean, that's kind of part of it. So the ECJ oversight has always been their issue. And that remains in part. Uh, I think in part it does, but it's particularly applied to the red channel. So for all goods that are going into the rest of the EU, in the green channel, it's less relevant because the scope of EU law is so minimal. And I think you have to look at, it's not just that it applies, but it's how it applies and the breadth of its application. And that is much narrower than it has been before. So this is the best they're going to get? Well, I think the question is, what is the alternatives? Where do we go from here? You know, the protocol bill is not going to be pushed and was never a real solution because it rips stuff down but doesn't build anything new. And then there's an election coming. You know, is there anything going to happen over that period? Unlikely, potentially into a Labour government then, which is certainly going to take this entirely different direction. So this feels to me the most opportune moment to secure the best changes to address some of the unionist concerns. And, and I think they have to look at that wider context. And to be totally honest, we have seen before where the DUP was in a very strong position and then didn't take a decision and things moved around them. Mm. And I just hope for their sake they don't do that again. Well, we'll hear from Sammy Wilson shortly. Raoul Ruperell, thank you for joining us this week on Chopper's Politics Podcast. Thank you. Thank you. Raoul Ruperell there. Now, all eyes in Westminster are on the Democratic Unionist Party. Will they buy the deal, this Windsor framework? 
One man who knows is Sammy Wilson, the DUP's Brexit spokesman, who we spoke to for this podcast just a few days ago for last week's episode. Sammy Wilson, welcome back to Chopper's Politics Podcast, and this time to the Red Line Pub. Now, last week on the podcast, last Thursday, you said this. I find it amazing that a Conservative and Unionist Party Prime Minister doesn't understand what it mm. means to be part of the Union. I mean, I would, I would have thought that being part of the Union was fairly clear-cut. Given the Windsor Framework deal, does Rishi Sunak understand what being part of the Union is? No, I don't think that he does, because, of course, as he admitted yesterday, Northern Ireland will still be subject in the future to EU law. And being part of the Union, as far as I'm concerned, means that British law applies to every part of Britain. And Northern Ireland is part of the United Kingdom, and therefore only British law should apply. And indeed, the, the problems that are going to arise in the future as a result of EU law still applying in Northern Ireland will replicate the problems that we had in the past and will still create that constitutional divide. And indeed, if you look at the framework document, it is clear that the government recognises that there are two ways in which Northern Ireland will be affected in the future. First of all, as UK law changes... And they say that the Office of Internal Markets will sort that out. And as EU law changes, and they say that the storm and break will sort that out. If you examine both of them closely, you'll see that neither of the two of them will stop that divergence. Let's go on to those details shortly. Is your point that you want Northern Ireland to be treated the same as Lancashire? or Cumbria, or Yorkshire. Absolutely. With no foreign power influence. And and the only difference, I suppose, is where issues are devolved and where the government has accepted that issues should be devolved to either Scotland, Wales, Wales, or Northern Ireland, then, of course, there can be differences. But those differences, and this is the important thing, are chosen by the people who have been elected in Northern Ireland or Scotland or Wales, not by some unaccountable bureaucrats or politicians in Brussels. And that's still there. You mentioned the Stormont break. Now, if 30% of Stormont voted against the measure coming in, then the UK government could veto it. That's how it works. Is that not a good thing? Well, first of all, it's not all EU laws we subject to that break only where they were going to have significant impact. How that's defined and who defines that, we still don't know. Secondly, even if Stormont and you you got the petition of concern, and don't forget, there's quite a lot of controversy around the use of petition of concern in Stormont anyway. And given that we've had 670 EU laws introduced since Mm -hmm. the protocol was in place, Mm -hmm. you'd be exercising that veto nearly every day, Mm -hmm. or else you'd be exercising it very rarely because you wouldn't be allowed Mm to, because the laws wouldn't make it significant. But then the UK has to exercise a veto in the Joint Committee. So the break isn't with Stormont. The break is with the UK government. And how often will, that, how often will it meet, the Joint Committee? Oh, well, at, at, regardless of how often it meets, how willing will the UK government be prepared to exercise that veto? Because don't forget, the same section in the Windsor Framework states that If the veto is exercised, the EU have the right to take appropriate measures. Now, we have heard time and time again that the government doesn't want to have a trade war with the EU. So is the government likely to exercise a veto knowing that the consequences might be by exercising a veto for a law in Northern Ireland, the whole of the United Kingdom might be impacted by the EU putting restrictions on trade? I suspect that the veto will never be used. And that's the problem. So it'll be a kind of an idea that's out there that's never quite delivered on. If you look at the European Scrutiny Committee in in Parliament, that was brought in to scrutinise EU legislation. But the government's admitted it did really little of the sort. There's so much detailed legislation coming and a small committee couldn't... Even Bill Cash's amazing work wasn't really enough to do that. Yeah, and, you know, it's not a storm and break if the ultimate decision rests with the UK government. The break's in somebody else's motor car. It's not in our motor car because the brake will only be applied if the UK government decides to pull the handbrake of the veto. And I don't believe it will. And as you have pointed out, given the level of EU law, 670 EU laws so far since the protocol was put in place, I doubt if Stormont has the capacity Mm. to look at each of those laws and scrutinise them and whether they have significant impact or not is not always immediately known. It's only sometimes down the line when the laws have been put into force Mm. that you'll know what the impact has been. 
the EU banning titanium dioxide. Titanium dioxide, what is it? It's a food colorant. Is that really going to affect trade? Is it going to have a significant impact? The truth of the matter is, one firm has already admitted that 140 of its products can't be sold in Northern Ireland now because of that one change in law. Would that have been a significant mm. change? Would the UK government have sought to veto that? I doubt very much, and yet it impacts on trade and it ensures that Northern Ireland is not part of the UK single market. On the plus side, Sammy, you have got companies in Northern Ireland who can trade in the single market and the UK single market, right? Yeah, but but, I mean, Chris, is that a good thing? I don't understand this concept. Companies in GB can trade in the EU single market. But they don't need to have this plethora of EU law continuing to apply to the rest of the UK. The access to the single market is still there for firms in Northern Ireland as a result of the trade agreement. For some um, (coughs) goods such as milk going across the border, there are no restrictions or anything like that. The truth of the matter is the Irish economy requires Northern Ireland milk. And I'm fairly sure that even in the absence of the protocol, they would find a way of getting the milk which they need because a third of their dairy industry, butter, cheese, etc., depends upon Northern Ireland milk. Do you think they're going to cut off their nose to spite their face? Yeah. I doubt very much. So even where there are goods which require special access, I believe that there are ways in which that could be accommodated. If a government minister was sitting here, they would say, don't let the enemy uh, of, of the good be the perfect. Don't they, the perfect idea um, gets in the way of a, of a, of a pragmatic solution for, you, for your constituents in Northern Ireland. Well, you see, I, I, I'm looking for the good in this, and I don't see it. Mm. Let's look at the spin that the government put on it yesterday. A storm would break so politicians in Northern Ireland can stop EU law. I've tried to explain to mm. you, we can't stop it. It would overwhelm Stormont. It can be significant, some, some laws, and it, we then rely on the UK government to take on the EU and veto it and take the consequences. In my view, not a great deal. When it comes to UK law diverging from the EU and therefore clashing with EU law in Northern Ireland, the Office of Internal Market is supposed to look at the impact and departments are then meant to take a cognizance of the impact when they're deciding whether or not to change UK regulations. Now, I guarantee it, every Brexiteer in the Conservative Party will say, are you really expecting us? to stay in lockstep with EU law in Northern Ireland to avoid the impact it may have on trade, they wouldn't. And all these problems are caused because of sovereignty. Sovereignty is very straightforward, isn't it? But is that not recognising the the very bespoke situation in the island of Ireland with Ireland and Northern Ireland? Well, you know, (laughs) we're not part of the Irish Republic. If the EU wants to protect the single market, let it take whatever measures it needs to do. But why should we protect the EU single market with all of this surrender of sovereignty and at the same time then damage the UK internal market? And that's what, to me, coming back to your first question, that's what being a unionist means. You put your country first and other countries, if they've got impacts uh, on them as a result of the decisions you make, it's up to them to protect their own. What's next for the DUP? When are you going to take a view on this? This is well, your view. When's the corporate view from the party? Well, I mean, obviously, and I think that it was the right thing to do, Geoffrey Donaldson said, we will look at it. Already, we've found that the VAT promises are not true, that the, uh, the promises about no paperwork are not true. The EU have already said that they may reduce paperwork from 80 documents down to 20 documents, but there's still... Be That's in the documents. red zone. No, in the green zone. The green, the green zone. zone, yeah. The, the, the goods will only come in if there's labelling, separate labelling, indicated that it's only for consumption in Northern Ireland. Right. So again, that creates a barrier uh, to trade. So as we dig into this, we're finding that a lot of the spin that there was is not uh, really reality. And once we have done all of that investigation into it, then we'll make we'll come to the decision. Is that this weekend, Saturday, someone said? I'm not... Well, a meeting? It, 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 well, we'll be meeting continually over this week. But, I mean, we want to make sure that when we... Because this is too important for us um, to get it wrong. When we make a decision on this, we make it with full facts available to us. But don't forget, Chris, we probably don't get another chance at this. And as far as we're concerned, if we get it wrong... 
It has long-term impacts for, for the union. It will lead to legal divergence between ourselves and the rest of the United Kingdom. It will lead to economic divergence. It will lead to economic diversifying trade, probably to the Irish Republic, and strengthening the idea of an all-island economy, as we find it's more difficult to get supplies from GB. So it's existential for the DEP, isn't it? it is, absolutely. And it should be for this government. And my worry is that it has not been. The primary aim of the Prime Minister has been, first of all, to be able to say he got a deal, he got a victory, and he'll gloss over some of the details. And that's what Theresa May did. It's what Boris Johnson did. Uh, The EU whitewashed them. And the fear is that the EU will whitewash this Prime Minister as well. How do you feel today? Do you feel let down by the government? Yes, uh, currently I feel that, again, all of the, the views that we had because we made it quite clear to the government, the bottom line, and they made it quite clear as well in the protocol bill, the bottom line should be no more EU law applying in Northern Ireland. And they haven't delivered that. So in, in that, that aspect of let us down. And how do you feel when you saw the King meeting Ursula von der Leyen shaking hands off this deal? Well, you know, I don't know whether it was his choice or whether the government uh, persuaded him to do it. But I think it's a very, very dangerous position for him to have taken. That's the king, because it's such a contentious space, this this debate. Well, I mean, first of all, it was calculated because there's no part of the United Kingdom that gives adherence to the monarchy and respects the monarchy as much as unions in Northern Ireland. Mm. All throughout the Troubles, that has the fact that we're part of the United Kingdom, the fact that the head of state has stood by us, etc., that's always been the symbol of the, the United Kingdom to us. As governments have come and gone, and governments have betrayed us. The one stable mm, thing it. in that was the monarchy. And I think it's it's a, a very, very dangerous thing that, that has been done. And don't forget, this is just not the monarchy taking sides on a dispute between the DUP and the government. This is government taking sides in an internal dispute within the Conservative Party. Yeah. You couldn't get deeper into politics than that. So why, do, know, they, why do the king do it? I don't know. And I think the King has to explain that. But uh, the one thing I do know is that it is a bad decision. And if he keeps going down this route and politicising the monarchy, then the status that his mother had, he will never acquire. And he will put the monarchy, in my view, in jeopardy because people will simply see it as a partisan rather than a national institution. Is the party going to complain to the palace? What do you do? I don't know how, how what the, what the, what do you do if you're well, concerned? I, I think that um, we have already expressed our view publicly and um, we haven't discussed whether we, we complain to the palace. We don't want to drag the palace into our politics either, by the way, Chris. I mean, I've got to say that we have more respect for the monarchy than that. And we don't expect the monarch to take sides with us because we recognise that that is dangerous. A decision was made, however it was made, we don't know. It was a bad decision. And I think it's a decision that the king will come to regret in the future. And just finally, marks out of 10. Well, uh, yeah, deal. As, as I say, we haven't seen uh, we, or we haven't no, examined in detail all of it. But all I can say to you is looking at it in, in, at a very superficial level, what have we got out of this? Sausages, solar panels and spaniels. Pets can now move. Those are the tangible things. We were looking for something far, far more substantial. Well, Simon Wilson, the GEP's Brexit spokesman, thank you for joining us this week in the pub on a busy day for you on Chopper's Politics Podcast. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Sammy Wilson there. Right, do stay with us, listeners. Coming up, we'll be hearing from the Brexiteers, Brexiteer, Steve Baker, MP, on what he thinks about this new Windsor framework. Right after this. We're interrupting this podcast to bring you news of another Telegraph show we think you might like. It's called Planet Normal. And it's hosted by me, Liam Halligan. And me, Alison Pearson. We're both Telegraph columnists who share the view that far too often those who shout the loudest on the telly just don't represent the views of normal people. So take a trip with us to Planet Normal. We're joined by some stellar guests, well-known voices from politics, business and the arts. All from different fields, but they have one thing in common. They're at the top of their game, but distinctly down to earth. The good news is I finally learned what a podcast is and even how you subscribe to it. It's actually quite simple. Search for Planet Normal on your podcast app or click on the link in the show notes for this episode. 
You don't really know what a podcast is, do you? I am one. Look, I am one. Who needs to know what it is? I am one, okay? Shut up. (laughs) Now, for plenty of Tories, the Windsor framework is Brexit, and it marks the end of a six-year odyssey to deliver on the result of the 2016 EU referendum. And indeed, for this podcast, it's the end of an era. We started off as Chopper's Brexit podcast. One of those MPs who believes that this is finally Brexit is former chairman of the ERG, the European Research Group of Tory MPs, and now a Northern Ireland Office Minister, Steve Baker. Steve Baker, Northern Ireland Office Minister, welcome to Chopper's Politics Podcast. Well, thank you for having me on again. It's an honour to be here. Is this deal Brexit? Yes, it is. You know, I was reflecting that after I resigned from government um, in 2018, I challenged my Eurosceptic colleagues. I said, we've got to have an answer on Northern Ireland. And we published a paper on it. And then that subsequently catalyzed the Alternative Arrangements Commission. And quite honestly, looking at where we are today and how we got here, I honestly don't know how we could do any better within the vision that we set out then than mm. we have done today. The DEP are unhappy. ECJ oversight is still there. They're concerned yeah. about how bits of it work, the red tape. Even this Stormont lock is concerning them because how often can it be brought in? Will it will it actually be vetoed? Will it overwhelm Stormont trying to check all this different EU well, legislation? We're going to have to go through all those details with them. But what I would say is that we've got this unique position in Northern Ireland. It's a post-conflict society and it has what is going to be an open border, which with great respect to Ireland, is a foreign country in a different territory. Mm. And having an open border in a post-conflict society is going to always be tricky. Now, I think we've come up with a way of doing it, which is a reasonable set of trade-offs. So the, the only the only EU law which remains is that which is necessary to maintain that open border without infrastructure. And I think that's reasonable. And so, for example, the Stormont break won't be overridden by the ECJ if it will go to arbitration between us and the EU. So, you know, this is a, a great way of constraining the ECJ and delivering dual market access, keeping the border open and actually allowing mm. Northern Ireland's place in the union to be thoroughly restored. So I'm, yes, a compromise. Yes, there are trade-offs, but I, I, we've got an honest solution here from Rishi, who's really engaged on the detail. I'm proud of it. And how close were you to resigning at the weekend you were said to be on resignation watch? Um, yeah, I could have resigned if if it hadn't been good enough in the round, I would have gone. But, you know, the trouble is, I'm so deep into this mm. now, for me to have backed a deal that I didn't truly believe in, I, I couldn't have done Well, you're that. a man of conscience, aren't you? And that's well, your own integrity, yeah. I think. But, you know, to be honest, in politics, you've always got to be willing to compromise to get through, and collective responsibility is very important. But on this particular issue, if I hadn't been able to bear collective responsibility with a good heart, I would have had to go. But when you look in the round at what the Prime Minister's negotiated, mm. I can, in good conscience, say this is a great position to reach. You've, you've, you've backed this deal. You, you've, you, you've come out early. You've given your boss, Richie Sunak, cover. What's Bill Cash said to you? What's Mark Francois saying to you? Are they happy well, about this? Because they, well, they're, they're deciding tonight at the ERG. Well, I, I saw them yesterday and I'd had the benefit of reading the documents and they hadn't. And what I said to them was, I listened carefully to concerns. It's the, the usual concerns about self-government, the ability to say no and integration of Northern Ireland into the UK's market with unfettered trade both ways. And I said to them then, look, you will want to read the detail. I have read the detail. I am satisfied that this is this is good enough. This is good. Mm. And since then, I have left them to it. I mean, I, I can't avoid being in the WhatsApp group since I started it. <laughs> I can't leave it. But I'm leaving them to it. They deserve the space, as the DUP do, to make what is a very difficult decision. All of us are so bought into this decision that in a DUP in particular, they just can't give way on the fundamental issue of the union. So this is a very difficult and painful time again for unionists and Eurosceptics. And um, I decided yesterday I wasn't going to do things by halves. I've once again been through the mill deciding. I decided, I decided that there's no point doing things by halves. So I've backed it properly. We've had Sammy Wilson on this podcast. He's concerned about it. The DUP are yet to decide. What's your advice to them? Do you think that they're so worried about the purity of the union, they're losing what could be a good deal for them. Do you know, I love those guys like uh, brothers and sister. Um, we've been through a hell of a lot together. But what I would say is that 
There's no escaping that Northern Ireland is a post-conflict society subject to the Belfast Good Friday Agreement in all its dimensions and that Northern Ireland is a territory with a land border with a foreign country which has to be kept open. And that is a different context to the one that we face in GB. Mm. And that implies compromises and trade-offs. And I would just really hope that they will agree with me that much as we'd like to live in a different world, we live in this world with these problems, and that therefore this deal is a quite a triumph actually and a good set of trade-offs. And I hope that actually members of the loyalist and unionist community will look at this and say, actually, this is going to mm. dramatically improve our lives. This is a reasonable settlement and a good basis to get on with our lives. And, and actually, yeah, we'll be able to buy anything in our supermarkets that's available in GB. And can we, you un understand, though, why they're a bit concerned? Yeah, of course I can. Yeah. Sammy's as hardline a Brexiteer as anyone in the Conservative Party, and he's got a very clear idea of what he wants, and he is a good man, and I like him. But it's just unfortunate that Sammy represents a, you know, a seat in, a, as I say, a post-conflict territory with a border mm. with a foreign country that's got to be kept open. Now, you know, if one were to build a fence and have infrastructure all the way along, mm. then we could have the same, exactly the same terms for Northern Ireland as we got for GB. But that, mm. that is not on the table. It is Nobody's what Brexit looked it. like when you were the RGE chairman all those years ago. Do you think, or, or would you have this well, pure view of a sovereignty which the well, DUP have? No, so I don't think that's quite correct. So when I first chaired the ERG after the referendum, its intention was, if you can believe it, to unite the party. I had all wings of the party in a big WhatsApp group. And we were working through with, for example, the Legatum Institute Special Trade Commission, what should be done on trade policy. Now, the reason I mentioned the Special Trade Commission is they effectively designed our trade policy, which I'm proud to have had some role in socialising around government. We're now doing it. That's a huge success. And Shankar Singham went on to lead the Alternative Arrangements Commission. And I think people was, I think the Prime Minister would say that there are echoes of all that work in this. I, as I said earlier, I resigned from government and forced, really forced the issue with the ERG. We published a paper on it. So I think we, we always understood, and I certainly tried to set up a committee to deal with this before the referendum, but we just didn't have the customs expertise to make it work. So I've always been engaged with this issue with Northern Ireland. And I think that this settlement is good enough in all the circumstances. We've got unique circumstances in Northern Ireland. We really do need political stability and, and mm. progress on public service reform. I think this is a good enough basis to get on, but I recognise that this is a very difficult and painful time yeah. for the DUP. Was the King right to, right to, to meet Ursula von der Leyen? Do you know, I, I'm unusual amongst Brexiteers. I think anything which tends to reinforce the European Union as being seen as a nation state is a good thing. So, for example, <laughs> I was really in favour of the EU being able to place an ambassador here. I said to you, it's great, because yeah. we keep saying it's becoming a nation state and people keep telling us, oh, no, it isn't. And it's a nonsense. It's got all the hallmarks. All and I said, well, if they want to send an ambassador, we should embrace that. And we should call them Mr. Ambassador and be respectful. He's and a meet nice him. guy as well, wasn't and he? And he's a lovely, he was a nice guy. And the new one's a nice guy. I was absolutely delighted to meet him. We've exchanged warm words. <laughs> and I shall look forward to a relationship with the ambassador of the European Union. And if the, the head of our state yeah. wishes to meet the president of the commission... Okay as he would meet any other head of state, that's great. My question is a bit different that in the sense that it's a contested space, this, this, this framework. Well, so look, and I'm, the DUP may mm, wonder why their, their head of state is meeting Ursula von der Leyen. Well, it, it, I think it's very important that the monarchy is not dragged into politics. Uh, but equally... But it's happened though, hasn't it, yesterday? I, I, I am proud of our king and I've met him and... Uh, it's different when you meet somebody you actually think, yeah, this is a person who's sincere about Northern Ireland. And uh, it might well be, and I, I've no inside knowledge, it might well be that the king knows perfectly well what risk he's taken mm. and that His Majesty has chosen, possibly, and I say I speak with no authority, he's possibly mm. chosen to take that risk because Northern Ireland is so dear to him. Well, it's not for me as one of his ministers no to second guess that and so i'm just going to support him and the prime minister do you feel this is the beginning of the end of the brexit division oh that we yeah. are go we are now moving towards a status quo position where we just well, stop, stop yelling at each other about brexit thank god yes so i think this moment bookends my eight years this year of working on this issue 13 years i've been an mp this year and um since 2015 i've been at the absolute center of this mm. storm and several others and you know, I'm just really hoping this will be good enough for the DUP and Conservative Eurosceptics so we can just get on with dealing with all the other problems we've got in our lives. It took, it took, it took a toll on you because you've been a 
Well, you fight for what you believe in over COVID uh, I'm, rules. Yeah, I'm afraid you, know, I, you don't stop. You don't resile from that fight. You take it on if it's there. It is what I came into politics to do. Look, the reason I got into politics was I was so fed up with the quality of politics and politicians. I thought emigrate, moan or stand. Now, one of the things I've discovered is that the reason politics is so often done so badly is because it's very, very difficult. It's much more difficult than I had any idea of in 2006, seven when I thought about coming into this. It's fabulously difficult, not least because the public are so disengaged from parties. One thing I could change is, for goodness sake, join the political party of your choice, particularly Telegraph readers, <laughs> big bell here. Get involved. Get it, for goodness sake, pay 25 quid a year and multiply the say you have in our system. It doesn't mean you have to support the party all the time. Have but, a say. But they do need to join and the how party. How are you feeling? Oh, I'm fine. You've you've got you've got what you campaign for. Well, you've not got until, your Brexit. Well, honestly, we're in this strange moment just now. Not until the DUP are on board, mm. uh, uh, unless and until the DUP can say they can live with this. We're in a a, a strange place because well, we've had Sammy Wilson on this podcast, which you won't have heard yet. No, there are issues. He's not happy about it. Of they, they haven't yet not. decided. What's your final message to him and to him and his, and his DUP MEP? I would say, Sammy, we we I don't honestly don't think we can do any better than this for you, and I wish we could. I do. I wish we could. But the, the, the particular circumstances in Northern Ireland are not those pertaining to Wickham, because I know he said Steve wouldn't put up with this for his community. But my constituency isn't in a territory with a border, with a fo- land border with a foreign country. It's not in a post conflict society, thank God. And in all of the circumstances, I believe this set of trade offs is a good set of trade offs for unionism. Well, Steve Baker, Northern Ireland Office Minister and former chairman of the European Research Group of Tory MPs, a Brexiteer to his heart. Thank you for joining us this week on Chopper's Politics Podcast. Thank you. You're very welcome. Steve Baker there. Well, listeners, I'm dying to know what you think about this new Windsor framework. Please do get in touch by email at chopperspolitics at telegraph.co.uk or on Twitter. We're at Chopper's Podcast. Thank you to my guests this week, Sammy Wilson, MP, Steve Baker, MP, and Raoul Ruperell. Thank you to my producers, Louisa Wells and Giles Gear. But most importantly of all, thank you to you for listening. I'll be bringing you every Brexit development blow by blow this week in my daily Chopper's Politics newsletter. So if you want to sign up, please do find the link for that in the show notes to this episode. And don't forget my weekly Peterborough Diary Gossip column out on Fridays at 7pm online or in Saturday's newspaper. And finally, as always, please do buy a copy of The Daily Telegraph. If you can, I know you won't regret it. Until next time, though, cheerio! Cheerio!